Well, it becomes the next man up mentality. And with RJ Broadhead and Luke Tasker taking the week off, you've got myself, Clint Bubba O'Neill from CHCH. And we bring in a heavy hitter, a 1998 All Canadian, most outstanding Canadian, and of course, a Thai Cats veteran, CFL veteran over 12 years, Mike Morielli. Uh, hey, Mike, we got quite an assignment this week. We do. I'm excited about it. I, it, it got me thinking, Bubs. Um, the last time we shared a booth, I, I have a feeling that may have been Iverwind Stadium for like a high school all-star game or something a long, long time ago now. <laughs> well, you know, and I did have the pleasure, I guess, for about three or four years when Kojiko Cable broadcast the games. And that was in the days at Iverwind in the CFL where not every game was televised. So we had the little local broadcaster calling my son, calling these games, and I got the pleasure of calling you on some of those outstanding tight cat teams with Danny Mack, and you just guys were unbelievable in those late '90 games. No, I, I listen. I'm excited about it. Obviously, you know, uh, I, I have to think that we're uh, we're pretty good fill-ins for the for the time being, and uh, we know our stuff and have been around certainly the Hamilton uh, community and Hamilton organization for a long time. So I'm excited about it. I look forward to working with you again and. I guess now it's time to kind of talk shop a bit. Well, talking shop, I mean, okay, let's start this off by saying this. The Tiger Cats go into Winnipeg in week one, 19 to 6 loss. Uh, and I think for at least maybe some of the national media, uh, I think we have to remind everyone that the world did not come to an end after one uh, week one loss. No, no, you're right. And, you know, I, I have this opinion, and I think it's probably a widely shared opinion, but you – probably won't see you know teams hit their full stride until about halfway through the season it's been a long time off uh there's been no preseason games offenses take a lot longer to gel than defenses do uh, going to be a lot of defensive football i think that you'll see but with the talent that hamilton has and the fact that they've played together and kept talent together year over year this is not a team that's going to play like they did in week one every week will they have some bumpy patches along the way absolutely Every team will. But, you know, as you gear up, this is a get-to-the-playoff league and anything can happen. And with the Grey Cup here in Hamilton, I mean, you don't need any more motivation than that. Well, along that same line, again, Jeremiah Masoli, and we talk about the Tiger Cats not playing a game in 670 days with the pandemic pause. You have to go back a little bit even further for the quarterback, Jeremiah Masoli, who obviously is coming off that serious knee injury who was hurt in July of 2019. So he's going to have a little bit more time, too, to also get himself back up to that 2018 MOP sort of status. Yeah, nothing replaces what they call live bullets, right? When, when you're in the game, it's coming at you and nobody's got, you don't have the red jersey on, you, you know, people can touch the quarterback and they can get in your face and they can cause a lot of problems. So that uh, getting back into the swing just takes time, takes repetitions. Um, you know, it, we always try to create controversy where there is none. And I don't think there is a quarterback controversy in Hamilton. There's just a way we got to get this team ready to, to play and we're going to put the best option to win and that may change throughout the season it may stay exactly the same it, it's going to come down to what happens on the field and it's going to come down to starting again uh this week against Saskatchewan let me throw you a quick question and again we're just talking a little bit about what happened last week and I'm sure Andy fan too so I'll ask Andy anything on the Ty Cats pre-game show and post-game show will maybe get this question there is a belief out there that some people and I'm, I'm going to ask you as a former player that maybe Dane Evans should get a couple of series here and there. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I, I tell you, being on the other side, being as a receiver, all you want is consistency. All you want to know is that you have a game plan that you're going into the, the play into the game with. It doesn't matter who the quarterback is. Obviously, you want you have a you you feel equally about both, but you sometimes gel better with one over the other, and that's just the nature of the business. But um, you know, if you start introducing reps here and there, the flow of the game does change. Sometimes it changes for the better. Sometimes it changes for the worse. And in the communication between center and the quarterback and with the receivers and approaching the line of scrimmage and all that stuff does not always match. So you can make what you think is a, a change regardless of the person. It could be Mazzoli in for Evans. It doesn't really matter. But there is a dynamic that changes. And it what it does, it has to raise the level of all the players on the field because they have to be aware that 
this is not what we just did for the last 15 snaps. We've got to pay attention, understand our assignment, understand the person behind center, um, and, and be ready to go. It's no different than adding a, a new offensive tackle. I mean, you, you just have to know that it's different. Um, there's no right or wrong way to do it. I would say, in my opinion, you want to stay with the people that, that brought you there that you start the game with. That's the ideal in any sport, at any position. You want to go with the same guys that lined up, you know, under, under snap, uh, snap one right through the end of the game. You talked about the offensive line and like we talked about what happened last week and now what we're going to see going forward. Big addition and what appears to be the returning of one of the most outstanding linemen in the game and on the O-line, and that's Chris Van Zyl, who was missing in week one, appears to be ready for week two. Huge boost. Oh, massive boost. Uh, again, this is, the, this is the veteran leadership. This is the... You know, you look beside you and, and you got that kind of warm blanket, right? The, the one that, that brought you there, the one you feel really comfortable about. And we take nothing away from, from the replacements, the guys that come in. But again, it's, it's a veteran league, especially in years like this, especially in years when you don't have a lot of time, when you have to make an impact right away, getting your arguably your, your, your top, you know, offensive lineman or, or at least the top tackle. I mean, that, that says a lot of if Chris Van Zyl isn't the top, you know, uh, then you know you got a good lineman, and, and, and he still maintained that kind of top status along the way. But it does add, again, a level of comfort for the quarterback. It adds a level of comfort for the offensive lineman, um, for the offensive coordinator. You just feel like a return to normal. So having him back is huge. Should bolster that offensive attack. Um, should allow for Mazzoli to get a little bit more time, a little more comfortable in the pocket. And, uh, you know, a chance to kind of get back to the, the lineup that they envisioned in day one. On the other side of the ball, the return of Ted Laurent. I mean, again, a huge disruptor on that defensive line. Appears like he'll be ready to go on the defensive line. Yeah, and I think the same thing applies, right? You, you, you have that veteran presence. You have that unwritten or, you know, unthinkable type stuff that happens because you're just on the same page. If you're Simone Lawrence, you know what Ted Laurent's doing on every single play. You just, you know it. You've seen it. You've talked about it. You've been there and you react. And, and when you plug and play, um, with, with new guys, new to the system, uh, new season, not being around for quite some time, you will have plays that just don't work. And, you know, I even sat and re rewatched the film and identified it, and I couldn't give you a proper answer because I don't know what happens in those game, game rooms or, or in the game plans. But I, I will say that anytime you go return a veteran, a veteran of all-star status, you're going to see a significant li uh, lift. So if you're adding, you know, Chris Van Zyl in the offense, and you're adding a Ted Laurent on the defense, you instantly got better, not just plus two. I think that gets multiplied because of the type of individuals you're putting in. All right, so let's look at this week's opponent. And actually, let's not talk about the opponent first. 33,350 filled the seats at Mosaic Stadium last week for their victory over the BC Lions. I had to go back in the history books, Mike. I went back as far as 20 years. Some of those games you were a part of. Not a very successful place for the Hamilton Tiger Cats over the years. And we'll just say over the last 10 years, the Tiger Cats end up with two victories. What is so difficult about going to one there, Taylor Field in your days, and Mosaic Stadium in Regina? Well, you, you kind of took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say, as we look towards this game, the one big X factor is the fans. Um, it is a, a great environment to play in. It's exciting. It makes you feel like, okay, this is, this is big time, um, even as a, a visiting team. But blocking out that noise is not always uh, easy to do. Uh, it is a beautiful stadium built for noise, built to – uh, you know, accommodate 33,000, but make it feel like 60,000. And, um, you know, the Saskatchewan fans are diehard and they are loud and they are now coming off of, you know, a, a kind of a sellout in, in, in week one and, and doing it again back to back. And Hamilton, to their kind of defense or, or to their credit, came, you know, from a hostile environment in Winnipeg. That's another market where you're going you're gonna to hear the crowd and they're going to be on top of you and it's going to be disruptive. So th there's no doubt that the team is well aware of that. Um, they have to work on, you know, a private snap count or quiet snap count and all this stuff uh, to be able to be ready to play. And, and, and sometimes it works out to your advantage that you use the crowd and you're able to silence them early. And I think that is the key. Once a crowd gets into the game, if they're allowed to stay in the game by the home team, then it, it 
becomes a daunting task. So uh, the ability to strike early, whether that's on offense or defense or a great uh, kick return or punt return, um, is probably going to be a telling sign uh, of how the game will play out. Yeah, it's funny, you as a player here, again, played in these hostile environments as in Winnipeg. And I mean, Hamilton, as when you were a member of the Toronto Argonauts, I'm oh. sure it could have been easy as well, too. But you know what? When you're on offense, obviously the crowd, as you said, and you described well, can really be a disruptor on offense. So what do you on offense have to do? I mean, you've got the guys on the sidelines and the opposing sidelines telling the crowd to go crazy. What do you have to do to counteract that? I know you said make plays. But how do you communicate? And I know that's something the fans are always interested in. How on earth is this opposing team trying to communicate to each other in this situation? Yeah, and that, that's the reason the crowd's going crazy. They want to disrupt that, that the ability to talk and, and to make sure everyone understands their assignments. So a lot of the stuff you need to do has to take place on the sidelines. You have to be prepared, stay as a group, it helps to speak offensively for now, that you, know, you can't be too far from each other because you know, once you get on the field, it's likely that the minute you break that huddle, the minute you get into your huddle, you're going to have a, huff, a tough time kind of understanding what everyone's doing. And as, as players, as receivers, for instance, you're always looking to kind of get out of the huddle so you can line up because, you know, sometimes you're getting a 35, 40 yard run just to get you your spot at that wide receiver position. In this case, you, you really have to lean in, you know, get, hear what you hear, whether that's through hand signals or that is through, um, you know, at the line of scrimmage or it's in the huddle itself, but it has to be shared across the line. And that just takes time. And I think in the Canadian Football League, when you have a 20 second clock, the time factor is huge because you have to get into the huddle quick. You have to be able to share information, you know, quickly and, and so people understand it. But when you have 33,000, that sounds like 60,000 bearing down on you, it becomes difficult. So um, that takes time. It takes repetition. You can replicate it as, as often as you can in practice. You know, I, I, going back to our days at Iberwin, we didn't have crowd noise. We literally had the guys that cleaned the stadium on Monday behind us with those big gas-powered, you know, leaf blowers, and we all were suffocating from diesel fuel as it came out. So I don't think it'll be that difficult for Hamilton this time around. But it is – it's a pain in the neck, and it, it does cause a lot of disruption. But if you're able to execute – you will see a crowd go from 100 down to 20 pretty quick uh, because they kind of change their allegiance. So that is really important to start off a game. Let's talk about the Riders and Cody Fajaro, again, the uh, 2019 Most Outstanding Player nominee in the West Division. Fifth year this year, started with the Argonauts, kind of learned under the likes of Mike Riley when he moved over to B.C., and, you know, his first start last year was a, a game against the Tiger Cats, which was won, I believe, 24 to 19. Dual threat quarterback, I believe. What does he offer for this Rough Riders thing? What makes him so good? You know, I, I've been really impressed with his poise. Um, you know, he's relatively new to the league, I would say. You know, certainly relatively new to the starting position. Uh, I was able to call that game uh, with Marshall back in, in 2019 when he came in and led them to a victory. And he did just what you talked about at the very end. He used his legs to get out of trouble, to move the, the ball down the field, to get in better field position. He is a, a dual threat. Uh, he, he is able to extend plays and get out of the pocket. And he plays well at home. Um, he, he's got a good arm. He's got a good football sense. So, you know, guys like that need to be taken off their game. And, and sometimes that's physically. You need to be able to get back there and, and touch them or throw some sort of uh, defensive schemes at him that makes him think. Uh, players, especially quarterbacks, love to react. They love to understand as they approach the line of scrimmage what they see, and then they just go up and execute based on what they see. But if you can fuse the look so that they think they're seeing one thing, and it, this Orlando Steinauer is brilliant at this, and then you show them another look, that's when you get the, them to be uncomfortable. Because if they approach the line once and it works, and then you approach the line once and the same look, but it doesn't, now you're second guessing what your reads are uh, pre snap. And if you can get the quarterback to second guess himself, or even the offensive line or anybody, the receivers, et cetera, then you're in a position where you've now gained control. Taking away, I think, some of the pressure from Cody Fajaro, he's a good reworked, just like Hamilton offensive line, 
and a guy by the name of William Powell in the backfield. Why is he so good? Oh, man, William Powell has a knack, and he, he did it in Ottawa. And we, we saw him do it uh, in, in Saskatchewan. He did it against the Ticats in 2019. He has a way, even if you've got him stuffed for three quarters or even close to 60 minutes, he has a knack for breaking a big run at the most opportune time. And, and we've seen it repeatedly. He's, he's done it to the Cats at, at Ottawa. He's done it uh, a couple years ago in Saskatchewan. Uh, I just think he has a motor and it's a sense for the game that he's able to, you know, find a way to get off a good run and, and, to, and to get a, you know, a swing pass on the back or whatever it may be. Right. He's consistent. He's a veteran. And he's someone that you can't overlook. Uh, he, he's somebody you have to key on. And if you're able to slow him down and stop him, then you now change your offense or defensive mindset to concentrate on the pass. Um, but if you, if you create that or let them create a balanced attack early, it does become more difficult to slow the, the offense down for sure. And, and I'm sure that they probably looked from the tape of what the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and Brady Oliveira, who was, ended up being the CFL top player of the week, I, I, I guess they're going to probably try to assimilate the same sort of offensive mindset you take a look at what they did against bc b saskatchewan opened up with a pair of drives in excess of 10 plays and again once you find your groove and you're able to execute on you know over two series you got 20 play drives i mean that's significant portion of your offensive snaps for a whole game i mean if you can get 50 to 60 offensive snaps in a game you're in, you're in great shape, I would say, more often than not. So if you're starting the game on the first couple of drives with, with 20 plus, you've now put a bit of a stranglehold on 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 the flow of the game. Uh, you've kind of taken control. You've kept their offense off the field, and I think that's the most important. Whether you know whether or not uh, you can hold the team to field goals rather than touchdowns is important. But the other important thing is getting your offense back on the field. So if you're the defense for the Tie Cats. You don't want these long extended drives. They do nothing for you but make you tired, and then they take away your best offensive threats. Um, so, being able to get a couple quick two and outs uh, if you're the tie cat defense, or you know, getting a great stop on on the first kickoff if you, if you're you know you're the team kicking off, or a big return if you're if you're on the return side. Uh, I, I think the bulk of this game could be won very very early on, giving all the circumstances that surround it. And I, and I think it goes for both teams. The Saskatchewan is able to get those big plays, those big drives and the, and the fans in it early. It could make for a, a longer game. And if Hamilton is able to, to, to defensively or offensively shut them down early, then the pendulum swings a little bit. You take a look at what Tommy Condell probably has all schemed up for the Riders defense. Mm -hmm. I think when you think about Saskatchewan, again, that first win came with them leading at one point, 31 to nothing. And then all of a sudden they deserve, they, 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 I guess they came to, uh, uh, I guess they were alarmed at the 31 to nothing lead of the CFL is the worst lead that you could possibly have because they escaped with the 33 to 29 victory. So probably some things there to attack there on that Riders defense. Oh, it definitely is. Uh, and and we, we can never, again, take anything away from this Ticat team on all sides of the ball. Um, they are very well coached. Uh, they have a tremendous amount of talent. I arguably some of the best talent in the entire league, uh, in my opinion. What they don't have is, you know, a, a the opportunity to, to have that sense of time to work together. Now, other teams are all in the same boat, so I'm not trying to create excuses here. But there is a notion that um, you know, they will remain this way. They will not remain this way. The Thai Cats will come out and they will hit on all cylinders and they will destroy teams as, as the season goes on. I, I, I fully believe that to happen. It's a kind of team that has not forgotten how good they are. Uh, they're probably incredibly frustrated with their first outing. Uh, I would say that across the board on both sides of the ball and on, on specials. And so they have a chance to redeem themselves. And anytime you can have an opportunity to step back on a football field, that's a good thing. Uh, the worst thing is coming off a, a loss and not having the opportunity to play again or, or, or redeem yourself. So uh, I, I think the mindset is, is going to be there. It's a rude awakening a bit, especially when you have a Toronto win, you know, uh, to complement your loss. Um, it's a short season. So really, I expect and I hope that uh, this team comes out firing quickly um, and maintains that throughout the whole game. Just aligning in what you're, what you just finished saying there. I guess I think the person I think of 
for everything you just described there has got to be Brandon Banks. Um, eight receptions, it's seemingly quiet, 77 yards in the – I know the MOP wants more. We saw shots of him on the sideline. Not being a bad teammate, but he certainly wanted to do more. Well, absolutely. Um, you know, he's been itching to get back on the field and play, especially after the season he had in 2019. Um, he is, a, you know, one of the fastest guys in the league still and probably lost a half a step, but that doesn't matter. And what you, what you lose in, in speed, believe me, I know, uh, you, you gain in smarts, right? So as you get older – um, you become a smarter um, receiver, a smarter football player, and you find the open spots and you try to take less uh, effort to get there, et cetera. Um, what Brandon went through last game was, was – most of it was just physical. I think he was hit a lot. Uh, we know he's not a, a big guy. and We know he's a slight guy. He has a great knack of avoiding hits, and, and that, that's why his career is, is continued on uh, as it has. Um, so keeping him safe is a huge priority. And I, I imagine, you know, we've seen many, many a time where he's made a catch and slipped the tackle and gone. No one touches him. Well, that didn't happen in, in Winnipeg. He was, he was hit and he was hit often. Um, and it does take an effect, but if anything, uh, it makes you stronger going to the next game. You know, I, t I tell you, this has been such a tease for me there, Mike. And uh, I think we're in for a fantastic game. Two of the most respected crowd bases in the Canadian Football League. Uh, I think two teams, again, very, very hungry for victories. Again, tough for the Tiger Cats. They open the season with three games on the road. But uh, you got to get your business done at some point. And I think you, after a good week of practice, Orlando Steinauer talked about how crisp they are. And I think that injection of the loss is going to have this team playing very, very, very well. I think we're you and I are in for a fantastic. Where else would you rather be on a Saturday night, right? Seriously, other than watching the Tie Cats on, of course, uh, 900 CHML audio, uh, TieCats.ca, and of course the Tiger Cats app. Mike, this has been fantastic. I'm looking forward to the game. I hope certainly you are as well. Too, you're a veteran of the booth. It's going to be a good one. It's going to be a great one, Bubs. Thanks so much for for bringing me on today. I'll see you. Uh, before you know it, we'll be calling some some live football. It's been a long, long time, and I certainly look forward to it. You get going at 9.30 with the pregame show with Andy Fantuz and, of course, my man Louie B. Join us again, as we said, on TigerCats.ca, the Tiger Cats app, and all the action later on CHML.